Okay, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the HP Latex R Series Academy. My name is Tom Wittenberg. I am the moderator for this event. Uh, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your schedule today. We know you're busy and we do appreciate you making some time for us to go through the R Series. Uh, wanna note, first of all, apologies for the confusion around the invitations. We're new to the technology and we've learned an awful lot, so I think we've got it resolved. And also, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box uh, so that we can keep a record of them uh, and we'd like to get an answer to as many as we possibly can. Finally, uh, if you'd like to learn more, we have another event coming up this week. It's the NBM breakaway sessions. Uh, I believe uh, there will be a link and the promo code to get into those that will be in the chat box. It should be just appearing now. And it's going to be a virtual trade show along with a number of speaking sessions. Uh, HP will have one from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern time on PrintOS Application Center and it's well worth your time to uh, attend. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Chuck Stein. He's our North American Sales Director for the Latex Industrial Products. So take it away, Chuck. Um, thank you very much. And folks, good morning to everybody in some areas. Good afternoon in others. Uh, on behalf of HP and my colleagues, we really want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Uh, this is the beginning of a series of virtual seminars that we're going to be doing. Um, our goal here is to keep you well informed, to make this interactive, to make it informative, and most of all, to make it enjoyable. As we go through these challenging times here that we all are facing, uh, we need to be bringing to your attention any new business advantage that HP can provide in working with both our distribution partners as well as our customers. And that's new markets, new applications, new business plans, and how we're going to grow and recover from this catastrophe here um, in the easiest and most swiftest ways. So you see up there a, a little comment from Enrico Lores, uh, our CEO. And if you just wouldn't mind just taking a moment to take a look at that, I'm gonna spend the next uh, few minutes just talking a little bit about how HP is doing uh, in this pandemic. And, what our little outlook is uh, from your perspective. So HP's first, shall we say, direction to their employees when this came out was, number one, have the highest concern for your family, and number two, have the highest concern for your customers. We hope over the previous weeks we've shown that. Our, our plan is to continue to do so as we all go through recovery. What you should know about HP now is we are a good, hopefully valued partner, and we're very financially secure. Um, we have the ability to have multiple different business platforms that are succeeding while, not, while others are being challenged. So as we look at this from the uh, HP perspective and the world perspective, um, we're starting to see some trends of the new normal coming back. Um, we're starting to look at this and say, you know what, the light at the end of the tunnel isn't a train anymore, but it's actual light. When we look at our business, we kind of look to the West and we look and we see this pandemic started in China. The recoveries are starting there. Maybe what's going on there is the next blueprint to what we're going to be seeing here in both Europe and in the USA. So what we are seeing is people are returning to work. We have nine factories in China. All of those are in full operation and production. And we are seeing an uptick in regards to business, okay, from both the distribution uh, and a customer perspective. We're seeing growth uh, in the PC market, um, the home PC market, printers, inks, anything that's home office related, uh, as you all could imagine, business is going through the roof. That diversification uh, helps us to stabilize and to stabilize our company and our markets and in return, help you folks work to recover and grow your business. We're also seeing in the past three to four weeks uh, a very serious uptick in regards to printed pages, in regards to the usages of our printers in the field. And that's giving us a lot of confidence that maybe the worst is over. And again, we are on a good path of recovery. We're seeing a real strong V curve that I know you've all heard about. 
So at this particular time, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our presenters and have them just talk a little bit uh, about their background. They'll be taking over the rest of the show here. Um, so first one is uh, Dan Donnelly, are you there? Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. How you doing, Chuck? Good. Hi, my name is Dan Donnelly. I am, um, I've been in the industry for about three decades. I've owned my own sign shop from the early 90s, as well as an online canvas company. I started in, in 2002. I'm with HP now about five and a half years as a solutions architect here at the Graphics Experience Center. I will be hosting the live portion of today's demonstration, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Dan. Fernando, tell the folks a little bit about your background, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Fernando Garcia. And like Dan, I do come from production as well. Uh, and I am a solutions architect as well at the demo center here in Alpharetta. And I will be presenting uh, a portion of the uh, features and technology of this awesome technology, uh, our, our printer. Thank you. So the key message we like to send is our folks are very production orientated. They're very production knowledgeable. And this is what all of this is about here. How can we help in production? How can we grow the business? Uh, so with that, the agenda for today uh, is fairly wide open and there'll be numerous opportunities for questions and answers. Um, basically, we're going to be going through uh, our strategy in the markets with Tom Gilio soon taking over. We're going to have uh, live demonstrations from our Experience Center in Atlanta with Dan and Fernando. Uh, we're going to go into some success points and applications on the, our flatbed. And obviously there'll be time for questions and answers. So before I turn this over to uh, Tom, uh, this is the beginning of a series of, again, informative and educational seminars that we're gonna be um, bringing to the distribution partners and our customers in May, June, and July. In the next week or so, you'll receive invitations from topics such as textiles, dye sublimation, latex roll to roll, latex flatbed, We'll have a series of fireside chats with industry experts. We'll also have a HP leadership webinar where you'll have the chance to talk to some of the HP leaders about how their thoughts are on where we're going and you know, what we're planning on and how the new normal is going to look. So thank you all very much for your time. Um, I wish you good health and safety over these upcoming weeks. Uh, let me turn this over to Tom Gigilio, who'll go into more in-depth technological aspects of the R Latex printer. Tommy? Thank, thank you, Chuck. Appreciate everyone's time today. As Chuck said, I think on behalf of the leadership of our graphic solutions business, our channel partners, uh, thanks for spending the time with us today. Um, the HP Latex R series has been just a, a, a great technology that we introduced to the market just under two years ago. Um, we've shared a lot of success with our partners and customers. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes teeing this up for our solution architects in, in Georgia. So if we look at the flatbed market segments prior to uh, 2020, this is, this is kind of how it looked. You really had three distinct market segments. We had a big play in the entry level space. And then we landed our first two R products, our plus units, the 1000 plus and the 2000 plus in this production category um, and then we still have a lot of play in our industrial space. So, so really, when it comes down to the segments, they evolve uh, year over year. Sometimes, um, sometimes there's changes in the, in the middle of a year. And that's kind of what happened with the R series. Uh, the big part about us adapting to the market is we listen to our customers. And we've consistently been able to do that with the R series. And that's why we think it separates itself from other technologies is that we listen to what our customers uh, would like to see from this platform and then we adapt the platform to those needs. So basically currently uh, in the entry level space you see our FBs went away, our UV technology went away and then we put a R1000 unit in its place because what the market tells us is that 
entry level customers want to experience latex. They want to have the they want to have the capability uh, to change their own print heads. They want to have the capability to deliver rich colors. They want to have the capability to have roll and rigid match and all with a very sustainable edge to it. So it's better for our PSPs, uh, it's better for their customers and it's better for the environment. So, so if you look at this, we have a great entry level solution uh, with our R1000. Uh, in the production space, we're gaining lots of market share. And then even in the industrial space, we see a lot of penetration. Um, people that have these 500,000 or million dollar uh, units like to use our series, especially for their white ink, because it does white ink better than any other printer, or because of the extended gamut that we have, or just the flexibility of using it, um, maybe in combination with an offset press. So we see a lot of uh, a lot of use across our segments. And that's one of the nice things about the R series that it's very, very versatile. If we look at the applications across North America, remember we're doing this with a single ink set, okay? And whether it's displays, corrugated acrylic backlits, whether it's fluted poly with coral signs, um, this is what our customers are doing. We are enabling them to print many, many different things off a single device without having any trade-offs. So, um, so that's been really, really kind of nice for us. And our customers have been able to do more project-based, um, more, more project-based business, which lets them scale their business a lot quicker. Um, so, so just about five things I'd like to share before I turn this over to our, our colleagues in Atlanta. Uh, what we've really learned of, about what matters most to our customers relative to the R series really has been centered around the ink. As you'll see today, the ink um, has an extended gamut, has colors that were never ever achievable on a flatbed printer before. And that's been the biggest factor in helping customers make a decision is just the incredible image quality that this platform delivers. Secondly is productivity and capacity. Uh, we're able to print uh, good productivity, but also have capacity in sellable modes. A lot of times printers have modes that are documented and aren't sellable. Well, up and down the productivity matrix on this printer, uh, we are sellable at all of our speeds. Uh, and that's one of the benefits about latex. Uh, our workflow being a hybrid printer, and being able to print multiple versioning, multiple sizes all at the same time without extensive changeover is, is a boon to the users and the people that adopt the R series. It's a very, very easy and productive workflow and, and our customers spend their time focusing on their business and not having to focus on managing the printer so much. One of the biggest things for me is the printhead architecture HP is one of the only manufacturers that actually makes the printer, the print heads, and the fluids or, or the inks, okay? Consequently, we invented the print head technology for the R series. The print head technology is, um, is significantly less expensive than Piezo, has a lot more nozzles, a lot more redundancy, and a lot more capability. So again, we're trying to empower our customers to keep their to keep their life in their own hands and not having to call a tech all the time to replace print heads and so on and so forth. So you'll hear more about that today. And then the white ink. And I couldn't really end, you know, five points of satisfaction without talking about white ink. White ink is, is really viewed on this printer as on demand because if you don't want to use it, you take it out and you put it back in when you want to use it. So you're not wasting a lot of ink and you're not fighting with it. So, um, you actually can increase your business by the quality that this white ink delivers. So, you know, just, just five things that are, you know, come, come to mind that are um, really special about this printer. So uh, with that, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, stop sharing and have Fernando pick it up from there and he and Dan will go through the live aspects of the demo. Again, thank you very much for joining today. Thank you, uh, Tom. So let me, 
start my share here. Okay, uh, you should be now seeing my uh, desktop. So um, I'll start by, uh, as we all know, uh, Latex uh, has been around with us uh, now for over 10 years. And early adapters of this technology have been waiting with anticipation for a Latex flatbed. Why? Because customers love our versatility, the productivity and ease of use of our technology. And that's exactly uh, what we did close to two years ago. We announced and launched the R series printers. The R stands for rigid. This product is a culmination of many years of research and development. It incorporates all the benefits I just mentioned and more like the industrial design of our 3000 series and our L1500. But it also incorporates features and uh, robustness of our FB UV flatbeds. I'm talking about the FB 550 and 750. So we give you the best of both worlds. Here are some compelling value propositions. We know latex is a water-based ink, so it's eco-friendly, it's odorless. And now with the R, even more vibrant, more vivid colors with a unique touch and feel when you print on rigid media and a wide range of substrates now, everything that we know in the UV world. In terms of productivity, we have unique designs and innovations like our productive bill system, which I'll cover later. Of course, you can print unattended, flexible media, even overnight, all with our HP PrintOS ecosystem that you can manage your jobs, your fleet, and your printers. The HP service experience and support with remote monitoring as well. And for the first time ever, HP Latex White Ink. It's a really opaque ink, one of the glossiest uh, in large format, all with automatic maintenance and relatively zero waste. So the printers uh, come in two sizes. And I'm gonna turn here my uh, laser pointer so we can identify better. So the R1000 can print up to 64 inches in width. The R2000 up to 98 inches in width. Both printers received the product of the year award last year at uh, SGIA. And this year, the innovations award at ISA. Both printers can print on rigid media with the help of the uh, support tables we see pictured here on the R2000, as well as flexible media with the roll to roll accessory. Here are some examples of these categories, whether you're printing rigid or flexible, the most commonly known substrates in the world of solvent based and UV technology and more. The printer can print up to two inches thick. If the media is two inches or less, chances are we can print on it. Unlike UV, we don't have to mask our belt. Our belt. We don't have to worry about loss of suction most of these products use only one source of vacuum. Ours is a very smart system. And so let me show you how that works real quick with our virtual app demo. So this is a rendering of our product. Uh, this is actually the R2000. It's a very neat application that our team in Barcelona developed. Uh, we can dive in a little deep here. And now we can see a graphic of this belt. Now this belt is a mesh-like uh, transferable material. It is designed to be printed onto. In other words, if you want to print pre-cut pieces, borderless, edge to edge, you could print on the belt uh, and print that extra bleed onto it. It does not hurt the performance of it. Unlike UV, it does not build up. Now, if we get a closer look, we see an animation here. You'll see some arrows in a moment, but these arrows represent three independent vacuum pumps. This makes it for a very robust vacuum system compared to flatbeds. Speaking of vacuum, we can see here on this animation how the system automatically detects where the media is traveling to maximize suction specifically in that area. So I never have to worry about taping the belt or masking it. Also, our belt has an accuracy belt. What does that mean? Well, unlike other belts in the industry, this belt is not a consumable. 
It is designed for the life of the product. Other belts, uh, you have to change them periodically because they lose tension, therefore affecting your print quality and registration. So our engineers definitely did their homework. And then unique to HP and our technology, specifically latex, we have an auto correction system. Essentially what this is, is a three inch device that sits below the belt uh, and it's called the optical belt advanced sensor. It's constantly monitoring the advanced movement of that belt so we can precisely move it and uh, give you the best quality possible. So that is our belt. Let's move back to our demo here. And so since we're talking about workflow, one of the uh, things that whenever we are evaluating and comparing print systems, one of the key features is we evaluate productivity and throughput. In most cases, the speed of the printer is determined by the type of workflow and operator efficiency. So let me explain. Here we see a graphic. This is called hot loading. It's a process of being able to load, print, and offload simultaneously. This comes from our uh, FB550 and 750 UV flat bits. They're, they're very successful because they, they can produce uh, quite a lot in such a small amount of time. And so we incorporated this process, uh, this product, uh, production workflow into our R series. How does it work? Well, you first load the sheet. When you're printing the first sheet, the printer will prompt the operator to load the next one. When that second sheet is being printed, you can now collect the first one you, you printed first, and the printer will prompt the operator to load the third one. This all happens simultaneously with very little effort. Why? Because we have input tables that can stage the media what one's being printed, and we have output tables that can stage the media as the, me uh, the substrates are being released. When we compare this to a competitor's workflow, right, a uh, typical flatbed, what happens? You load the sheet on the bed. You now have to determine if there are any open vacuum zones you have to mask. Of course, that's going to take some time. We hit the print button. Gantry comes out, out of this home position, prints across the bed, and until that gantry doesn't go back to its original home position, the operator cannot offload. So obviously this process is gonna take more effort and time to produce a production run. So what we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna go live and show you how this process uh, works. So I'm gonna stop share here. And we're gonna switch cameras here. All right, so we are live. Welcome to the input side of the R2000. We're gonna get a production run going for you. This is an example of a typical day in a shop. I'm in front of the R2000, 98 inch wide belt. If you're paying attention to Fernando's notes, there might be a test afterwards. 98 inch wide, that means I could print a four by eight board in uh, at landscape, right? Or increase my production, I'm gonna take two four by eight boards and put them in, in portrait mode, two at a time, right? We call that multi-up. What you're going to see here once we get printing is multi-up on 18 by 24s. 18 by 24 corrugated plastic, very typical job that you'll do in your shop, roadside signs, real estate. Uh, etc. When the operator comes in in the morning, you go to the IPS and we hit something called check and clean. That's it. Now, what's happening? The printer is now waking up, wiping the print heads, checking the nozzles, making sure they're all going to fire perfectly. Now it's ready to print. In that time, the operator's doing what? Ripping jobs over, maybe getting some media ready prepping it on the table here, you know, maybe getting my, my media ready to go. I'm working while the printer is working. It's very important right, to that efficiency. That operation takes maybe six minutes, seven minutes total. But again, you're doing something else while the printer is getting ready. You're not uh, doing any manual labor, wiping print heads, et cetera. Now we're ready to print. 
the operator goes to our substrate library, which pulls all the information from PrintOS that will manage this media. For example, this corrugated plastic, it'll manage this through the printer. Correct temperatures, vacuums, everything associated with that, all set, right? Set and forget. We're, remember, we're just going to focus on printing. I tell the machine, I tell the printer, I'm going to load my corrugated plastic. It'll automatically, will set up where the vacuum will engage when it needs to, allow me to, to load the pieces. It will measure the thickness of that media automatically. It'll measure, measure the width of that media automatically. It'll measure the position automatically, whether I have one sheet or multiple sheets. In the case I have multiple sheets, do I have to tell that I'm putting multiple sheets in? No. I just load the sheets, it does the rest. Crazy easy. Now, my media is loaded. What about my artwork? The artwork comes from the RIP, Caldera or, or maybe Onyx. I can take that artwork, drag and drop that into my print queue. And now the printer will automatically place that artwork where it needs to on the printer. This was printing really fast right now. I want to show you something else. We are now printing our corrugated plastic four sheets up but now we're but our job calls for eight big job we're going to print eight sheets see the light the light came on if you could pick up on that the alignment bar came down and met the belt allowing me to place my sheets right in position the vacuum turned off automatically here on the input side to allow me to lay that media in there however the automatic vacuum system did not turn off in the print zone for obvious reasons, very important. That stays. Wherever there is media, that, that vacuum will be holding that media down. Right? What happens? I load the media, the alignment bar comes up, the vacuum engages. We're printing again. We're printing the second row already. Did you notice I went from sheets to sheets? No stop in the printing, never stop printing. We call that hot loading. I'm printing at a three pass on my roadside signs. I can print 27 boards an hour, four by eight being a board, 27 four by eights an hour. Now, that's not the only job this morning. We've had, we have some foam board to do next. Okay, fine. But it's a different orientation, could be a different size, it's a different thickness. Well, obviously there's going to be different heat settings as well, a different product. Again, operator says, hey, I'm doing my phone board. All of our information from PrintOS stored here in the IPS gets applied automatically. Operator doesn't have to do anything except choose that phone board and load it when the printer is ready. But wait, we're going from Coreplast to a phone board. I keep looking over because it's fast. I have to be ready. The printer will tell me when it's ready for the phone board because I'm printing the foam board at four pass. And I'm, happy to, and I'm going to lay down more ink too, 90% ink versus 80. I'm using different artwork, different orientation, like I said. This is a completely different process. Our latest firmware update is allowing us to now do hot loading with different materials. First, I'm doing the corrugated plastic. Now I'm going to do the, the foam board. The printer, what the printer will do is, again, the automation that comes into play is it signals me to go ahead by, by turning this light on. As you can see, I'm loading the foam board. Well, when I'm standing on this side of the printer, that's awesome, right? What if I'm standing on the other side? How would I know when it's time to load the media? Well, we have a progress beacon as well. I could see that from anywhere in the shop, that yellow, uh, beacon will be blinking, signaling me to come over and load this media. Also, queue change notification. So the printer's telling me, hey, Dan, you want to put in this new media? Just checking. It even shows me thumbnails of the artwork so that I'm sure. Okay. So here you see what the automation is like. This is what it looks like when you come in the shop in the morning and you want to start printing. You just saw it live. This is exactly what it looks like. No tricks. Right. 
So what we'll do next is we'll go to the output side and we'll take a look at those corrugated plastic signs and of course the foam board. So here we are, running fast. As Fernando pointed out, these tables act as a staging and a collection. Staging on the input side, collection on the output side. <clears throat> we have our corrugated plastic, and if you're paying attention, which we hope so, uh, you can see that it's all different artwork. So that was another surprise, right? I could print eight of these, using eight as our production example. Or I can print, um, you know, one of each design eight times, or any combination of of art and and combination. So, as you can see here, I'd like to point out these really bright colors. I know it's video. I mean, we're we're virtual here, but this is three pass, eighty percent ink. That's not even a hundred percent of our ink. There is no banding litho-like feel, super smooth, great quality, and cost savings, right? Also, you saw it just came hot out of, hot off the presses, oh, right? Yeah. And I could, Hi, right? I could really destroy this, try to, and try being the operative word, okay? Why, this is important for obvious reasons. You wanna put out a good product. You wanna be able to take this and hand it to your customer. That's awesome. What if I was printing full sheets, my four by eight sheets, maybe 10 up. I could gang these 10 up and then go to my cutter and cut them afterwards. You'll have no problem, no chipping. If you're routing, if you're vibe cutting, uh, drag knife, no problem. We do it here all the time. The ink is flexible and the adhesion's amazing. Remember, this is the same inks that we're using on for for a decade now, right, on car wraps, or wall graphics, floor graphics, things like that. Very, very durable. Now, if I'm running the shop, I'm, I have two jobs here today, so hopefully I have more than two jobs. You can see the operator could just be on that input side, continually loading, come around this side, exiting. Also, because of the automation I talked about with where the media has all of its presets, and it's allowing me to load multi-up, uh, one-up, three-up, five-up, doesn't matter. I can choose on the fly on how I want production to run. I might look over here and see that my, my uh, cutting area is getting bottleneck. All right, let's start going to, let's go to cut and then print versus print then cut. That's the versatility of this printer on the fly. No masking auto loading, auto measuring, auto everything. Before I go, I want to show you something here now with their, our, our foam board, right? Foam board, I said we ran at four pass because I wanted to put a little bit more ink on there. So I, I went to 90% ink. Maybe it's an interior POP rather, rather than our roadside sign, right? Check this out. It's unbelievable. The quality on here, the details, the color, litho-like feel. Like I said, you can't, it feels like there's nothing printed on here if you close your eyes. Also, skin tones, skin tones and bright colors, right? And of course, our gray balance and our awesome reds. Remember 90% ink, this is just the beginning. One thing I want to point out too, full bleed. So just showing no bleed, full bleed, three pass 80, four pass 90. You're getting it now, right? Really cool. Okay. So Fernando's going to talk to you about the ink technology. Before we hand it over to him, I just want to show you our ink set, where it's situated on the printer and how the operator needs to deal with that. So here, here we have the, our ink set. These are five liter containers. 
on the R1000 and three liter on the R2000. Uh, <laughs> Slow down, Dan. Five liter on the R2000. Three liter on the R1000. There we go, Monday. So these are, you get your ink cartridge like this, operator drops it into the appropriate slot, and we have a quick connect. This is good for hot swap, meaning we can let this run right out, we can continue print, and put a new one on on the fly and keep printing. We have CMYK, light cyan, light magenta. For those that, of you that already know latex, we do have optimizer. What's different with the R series inks, one of the things is that we have overcoat. Fernando would talk to you about overcoat. And of course, our white ink. Our white ink comes in three liter only, and we have two connectors uh, because of our white ink management, management system. All right, awesome. Thank you, Dan. All right, so we'll go back here and we'll share my screen once again. All right, so our HP Latex R printer ink. So before I dive in into the benefits and in, in what's new with the R, uh, we need to compare this technology to something known as the standard in the industry. And what is the standard? Well, UV, it's a wide recognized technology. It has a wide range of applications and can print on many substrates, and it does have good durability outdoors. But UV ink does have some challenges too. For example, they tend to smell. Why? Because they're solvent based. Even post cure, even two weeks, even two months after printing, they still have that particular characteristic of that unique smell. This is why they don't get the highest certifications in the industry. UV has gloss matte banding. This typically happens when you print bidirectionally at higher speeds. Then, depending on whose formulation or branded ink you might be using, you might be limited with color gamut or limited to uh, having good adhesion or ink chips and cracks when you route it and hand cut it. What if you have multiple ink sets with different printers across your floor? So that'll be a challenge trying to match uh, across all that technology. And then what if you wanna laminate UV? We know UV has a rough texture. It has low and high spots. So you might get something called silvering. Competitors force our customers to make trade-offs. Sure, they'll sell you an ink for a great adhesion, but at the trade-off trade -off or expense of not having good gamut, what if you want glossiness? Or what if you wanna do thermoforming? So you need an ink that has elongation. Well, guess what? You're gonna have to switch that formulation. What if you wanna print of a vehicle wrap or have the flexibility so that the ink doesn't chip or crack when you cut it? It's rare to find a one single UV ink uh, formulation that can cover all these applications. And of course, this is gonna come at a higher cost. So then why switch to latex? Well, now with the R, more than ever, we deliver unprecedented quality never seen before in rigid printing with the highest gamut ever, than ever before. Consistency across multiple substrates and applications across your campaigns. And best of all, we respect the integrity and properties of the media. So what has changed? We took that very successful ink formulation from our, all of our latex products, and we reformulated it to cure at a lower temperature. This allows for a wider media versatility, meaning we can print on thinner plastics now, like polystyrene polypropylene, polyethylene, polycarbonates. We still maintain that optimizer that uh, latex is known for, right? Optimizer helps us with uh, quality and speed. Of course, we still maintain the color, but now we have a separate component called the overcoat. What is the overcoat? Well, it's that very same anti-scratch property that our previous generation has, right? The anti-scratch agent. It is now a separate component. It's got its own cartridge and its own print head. We did this to allow the end user to be able to configure the right amount of durability and protection for each application. If you wanna add more overcoat, you can. 
What if you want to laminate? Well, you don't have to. You don't have to use overcoat. So this is going to translate to ink savings. So even though we're printing with three layers, optimizer, color, overcoat, we still maintain those properties like our large gamut. If you print on media that is glossy, guess what? Your print is going to look glossy. If you print on media that is matte, your print is going to look matte. What if you're printing on metals like a brushed aluminum or a foil? Your ink is going to look metallic. Here's a comparison between UV curable ink and latex. UV does not evaporate, so it cures everything. Therefore, you get low and high spots. You get that rough surface. This also contributes to that matte gloss banding I spoke about earlier. Why? Because when the light hits it, it refracts differently from the low and high spots. It looks different to your eye. Now, our latex ink has a really smooth surface, a really thin layer of ink. We're talking about three to six microns. So this gives us those benefits, no orange peel, meaning no coalescence. We maintain that flexibility of the ink, no chipping, no cracking when cutting. You can still laminate over it. And it's environmental, environmental design that latex is known for. How about color gamut? We added more pigment to this ink on the R for a wide gamut, more vivid colors, meaning you can now reproduce up to 70% of all Pantone colors. This is going to help you achieve and produce those hard to reproduce corporate branded colors that we all know and more that UV has a challenge with. Take a look at the smaller gamut here. This smaller gamut represents the Canon 261 to 58 series inks. These inks are designed for ink adhesion. So therefore the trade-off is color gamut. So we're gonna give your operators, your business and the environment what matters the most. The highest certifications in the industry like Ecologo, Gringar certifications, the highest. No need to ventilate your printer because we, had, we have no harmful VOCs, it's odorless. So overall, better for us, better for the environment. What about the white ink? We left this separate because this is a big deal. When I say white and we think about UV technology, we think of waste. We think of hard to maintain. If you ask 100 customers that are using white ink in their UV technology, 5% say that they're using it, 95% say no. Why? Because it's a pain. If you're not using it, you're purging it constantly. Ever since the launch and the introduction of the R series, today, all of our install base, 96% of the customers are using white ink because it's very easy. Let me show you why. White ink, our HP Latex white ink, has no photo initiators in it like UV. That means it stays white over time. UV, once it gets exposed to indoor outdoor lighting, it starts turning yellow three, six months into it. One of the glossiest whites in the industry. Our latex ink is a true white. It has no cast to it. Best of all, it's easy to maintain. Dan is gonna cover uh, in a few uh, how this works and with relatively zero waste. So we're gonna go live. We're gonna show you how the white system works. Okay, so we will be going live on three, two, one, live. We're back. We've got a job just came in. We have to print with white ink on this black PVC. So what does the operator have to do that's different? I have to know what am I gonna do? How am I gonna print with white ink? Wait, nothing's different, it's just the same, just the same. You'll sound familiar, go to my substrate library, I pull in my black PVC, all of my information is here. I load my media, auto thickness, right? What about my jobs? What about the job with white ink in it? Well, the job is set up in your RIP with uh, spot white, flood white, white only, whatever that might be. That comes into your queue. What does the operator have to do? Drag and drop, same thing. Operation stays exactly the same, right? But now I'm printing with white ink. 
well, but wait, what about, don't I have to like, wait, I have to shake the white ink, right? Before, no, nope. done. Uh, how about, oh, wipe the print heads, right? Because they might not have been firing at the, no. Nope. Oh, the printer does that too. Hmm. Okay, I can do this. Uh, drag and drop, hip print, that's it. Well, you know, I, white only, we're printing with just white. That's great. But what about, what if white lays down first? You know, and then I'm going to put color on top or I know, lay down color white on top. So how do I manage that? Let me bring it back around, run it through again. Never. Always one time through the printer. The printer takes care of it all. You load your media, you drag and drop your art files, you hit print, and now you find something else to do, which I'm sure the boss will find something for you to do, all right? Why one time through the printer? We have two white print heads on our, on our carriage, and they're staggered in relation to our, our, our color print heads. So like a, the printer will lay down white, then color, or color, then white, or combinations of that, white only. In fact, Fernando, do you have that slide that you can show that we have uh, different modes, different layering modes. And in fact, the latest firmware update that has just increased our speeds and added more functions also included some new layering. Do you have that one that you can describe? Sure, then I'll, I'll show them. All right, so we're gonna stop share. Uh, I'll say star share actually. And we'll show you those uh, different options. So this is what Dan was talking about. We have different uh, uh, white print modes available. Uh, so under flood, what is under flood? Well, this is designed to print on darker media. Uh, so you lay down white first, color on top. The other option is over flood. Uh, this is the opposite. We're gonna print color first and white on top. This is typically done with clear substrates like your acrylics, polycarbonates, plexiglass, even clinks. Then we have the spot mode. Spot mode gets printed into a single layer, nor the white or the color overlap each other. And also spot mode can be used to print on white only. It's one of the fastest print modes. And then we have our sandwich modes. Our sandwich modes are split into three and five layer modes. What is a three layer? Well, it's also known as the day and night. Day and night, what that means is we're gonna print co uh, color, white, and color. This is uh, typically an application where you find, let's say a bus shelter and you have a light box in a bus shelter. And during the day, the light box is gonna be off. And at night, when the light box comes on, we don't want that print to look uh, uh, too pale or, or undersaturated. And that's what that third layer uh, 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 purpose is for, right? To compensate for that extra light source. Then we get into the five layer mode, also known as the blackout layer. Now the blackout layer, uh, we print color, white, black, white, and color. Now, this is done uh, in a single pass. Both of these uh, happen in a single pass, all in registration. Now, the five-layer mode, an example of that is where, uh, let's say we print, um, uh, you go in a store and you have a glass store and you have a sign that says in and out. This way, it allows you to print different images, uh, both on the uh, front side and the back side. All right, so these are the different modes. I'm gonna go switch uh, back to Dan here. And we're gonna go live on three, two, one. Thanks, Fernando. That was a perfect description. Makes it way easier to understand if you're not familiar with that layering process. Um, the finished products look like this. This is a clear acrylic printed second surface. So as the, we're printing the color and then the white is laying on top, ultra smooth, looks like it's a smooth vinyl on there. This could be a museum sign or you can also make this a backlit sign, right? Or you can go down to your local big box store and buy a chunk of wood and uh, turn it into money. So beautiful on wood, maintains the surface of the material, uh, looks like a stain on there, really incredible. Metal, right? Something metal, brushed aluminum, for an example, using white ink, using just our color, takes on the 
characteristics of that metal base. You're not hiding that. That becomes part of the design and part of the offering. Of course, we do flexible. So this is a static cling with white ink. I mean, it's very light, not heavy and puckery like UV. Awesome product. As you see, our prints were coming out behind me as I'm talking because this is Mr. Automation Machine. This is a spot white, a white only. Unbelievable quality, almost three dimensional, printing really fast, right? Skin tones, flesh tones, details, very smooth. Same story, our white ink behaves just like our color ink, same stretchability, same three year outdoor unlaminated. We can print awesome stuff, you know how it's done inside. We also have to take care of our ink though, and that is where people feel that pain of having your white ink when it's UV. Here, the system takes care of, it with, of itself with something called macro recirculation. It starts with our white ink, on one end, our white ink supply, and ends with our, what we call a auxiliary printhead. Our regular printhead here and our auxiliary printhead look very much alike. There are no nozzles on our auxiliary printhead. What this does is when I replace my two white printheads with the two, white, uh, the two auxiliary printheads, this allows the ink, the white ink, to actually rotate through the printer. It allows it to come into one channel and out the other channel of this bow or auxiliary printhead. I am going to take the white printheads out here now, and you're going to see it in live. You're going to see in actual time. What does it mean if I don't have any white jobs to print now? I just have some color jobs for the rest of the day or the rest of the week or the rest of the month. It doesn't matter. I'm going to take out my white printhead so that I have zero waste. My white printheads are protected, and my white ink will always be ready when the next white job comes up. And here's what that looks like. The operator simply says replace so the printer knows what we're doing, allows me to lift open the lid, giving me full access to our print carriage. Very simple. Also giving me full access to where we will be storing the white print heads. I remove these two chambers that are called, that is the offline rotation chamber holding these two cartridges. W1 and W2 for print head one white and print head white number two. I take out the auxiliaries that I have in there now because I am printing with white ink. Simply open the latches and pop these out. You've probably done this at home with your desktop printers. Now, maybe not with white ink, but with your ink. So this is just a larger industrial version in a sense. So I'm removing my white print heads, one and two, and putting these into the offline rotation chamber. Why? Because that is essentially a capping station. You have white ink print heads that have white ink in them. You do not want that to dry out. You want those print heads to remain healthy and, and ready. I'll simply drop my auxiliary print heads one and two into the empty spaces that were previously occupied by the two white print heads. Now what do I have to do? Just close the lid and I tell the printer, finish and check. All it's doing is making sure that I put them back in correctly and close the latches correctly, protect the printer. Right? It says here that I did a good job, success, hooray. Participation trophy for me. <laughs> so, what we're gonna, so what does this mean is that you just saw what it takes. Now I'm a six color printer. Boom, go back to printing. When a white job comes, replace that, uh, reverse that process. And now I have a printer with white. Awesome, that was awesome. Thank you, Dan. All right, so let's go back here. So let me share my screen real quick. So folks, this is our ink technology. You just saw color, you just saw white ink, right? With one formulation of ink, one ink set, we're gonna give you versatility across different applications, whether they're indoor or outdoor, the different markets that uh, you can uh, expand your business into. So what about our print heads, right? 
remember Dan? He talked about ease of use, right? The, the, the little intervention by the operator. The operator never has to touch these print hits. The last thing you want is for an operator to come in in the morning and spend 20, 30 minutes trying to revive nozzles, even between jobs, because the printer sat overnight or over the weekend. Because that's typically what happens with UV, right? This is daily maintenance with piezo technology, periodic cleaning between jobs. The operator has to wear a protective gear because we're dealing with harsh chemicals, solvent based to be able to open these nozzles and clean them by hand. And these print heads, if you don't clean them right, they will degrade. Some of these systems have over 24 print heads at a time. So it can get very costly. So with our HP latex thermal inkjet technology, right? It's a consumable, it's very affordable, and best of all, easily replaced by the end user. These characteristics minimize production downtime, it maximizes the peak printhead performance, and maintains the highest print quality. So as we see on the, on the graphic here, this is a four and a quarter inch swath designed for productivity and throughput. This printhead is split into two chambers. This is what is, is, is known as the um, bicolor configuration. Each chamber can host a separate color. We also see five separate dies below the print head. Each of these dies with two rows of nozzles to drive each of those colors. Each die with over 2,000 nozzles. This gives this print head a total of over 10,000 nozzles per print head. We have a lot of redundancy here. This gives you a nozzle density of over 1,200 nozzles per inch. What does that mean? It means 1,200 DPI resolution optically, regardless of what speed you print. So this revolutionary nozzle design produces the highest quality prints, flawless radiations, and the finest details. Now, another thing that's unique about this print head technology on the R is we have what we call micro pumps within the nozzles themselves. This helps us uh, re reliably jet out the ink uh, for better quality. The way it works, as you can see on that animation here, we're constantly pushing and flowing the ink within the print head. This to be uh, at, at a ready state, even if the nozzles stay idle over time, even if you don't print for a while. This translates to ink savings because we never have to perch. Try that with UV. A UV printer sits for 20, 30 minutes between jobs. Guess what the operator is, is going to have to do? It's going to have to purge and waste that ink. So now how about, how about flexible workflow? Well, for that, let's utilize our virtual app. It's better represented this way. So I'm going to turn the printer around here. And let's talk about flexible workflow. So we all know there's roll to roll. There's roll to free fall. There's something called table top roll holder, which I'll explain. But before I get started with these, there's a very, is, there's a very unique feature in the R called the anti-skew feature. What does it do? Well, at the very beginning, when you load flexible media, this feature automatically realigns and squares the material. Why? Because we don't want any ripples or wrinkles traveling into the print zone. Even if the operator loads the media skewed or crooked, this fixes it. I think this is pretty cool. In terms of roll to roll, uh, as the name implies, you're going to be utilizing the supply and take up spindles. This is for unattended printed printing, uh, even overnight. So the operator late in the afternoon queues up a job, hits print, goes home, comes back the next day, and the job is complete. It just works. And then we have roll to free fall or roll to fall as it's also known. This is uh, uh, this kind of workflow is used for urgent jobs. First in, first out. As the jobs come out, you can cut them up and take them to finishing. Also, let me point out, you could print right off the edge of the lead edge of the uh, media, so relatively zero waste. And then finally, we have our table top roll holder. This is designed for those urgent jobs, for rush jobs, for uh, shorter runs, because we never get rush jobs in the middle of uh, a, a, a job, right? Uh, or production run. 
So in the event that you have to knock out two or three banners or two wall covering panels or what have you, there's a reprint. You could just simply take the roll, place it on top of these cradles that are positioned on top of the tabletop roll holder or, or the, the input table. And now you can run these short runs. What if the core is damaged? Well, you could use this as well. What if the core is a non-standard size, like two inches or six inches? Again, this is a viable option. Customers love this feature. So I'm going to go back here. And we're going to go to Dan now, because I believe he's uh, actually uh, using this workflow right now. And he can show us uh, how that works. So we're going to go live on three, two, one, live. So if we're doing our job by now, you know this is a hybrid printer. Yeah, yeah, right. So we ran Coreplast, we ran foam board, ran PVC, rigid. And what about our roll to roll? Well, of course, Fernando taught you that. Now what I'm showing you here is what that tabletop looks like. It's the fan favorite when it comes to production. I can just simply throw a roll right up here on top of the table. I don't even have to uh, attach it to the take ups or the supply spindles and the take up spindle for these short runs. I can go from rigid to flexible and to rigid. I have some banner on here. Of course, that can be um, vinyl, any flexible roll material. And it's done through the uh, genius of these rollers, tabletop rollers. You get two of them. This is one. You get two of them with the printer. And they simply, there are preset pre pre holes. We have a stop. So you can set these wherever you want on the, on the table, depending on the width of your media. Drop them in, load the media, and guess what happens? Oh, automation, surprise. Again, operator, I'm choose banner. The printer knows. I'm choosing tabletop. The printer knows. It behaves accordingly. Locates the media. So wherever I put it on here, I can put it over here, I can put it over here. Measures the location and the width automatically drops the artwork on it. Couldn't be easier, right? Easier and faster. Now I want to get back to my rigids again. When this is done, roll it off, take these off and store them underneath, and of course start printing my rigids. Uh, real life situation, I want to say personally, doing um, uh, uh, wrapping cars. I, I don't, I'm not good at, you know, I don't consider myself an installer. I was printing for the company that was wrapping a car and they messed up a panel. They came in and told me why they were wrapping. I was able to throw the vinyl up on here, print a panel straight to laminating because it is latex, right out, didn't miss a beat, got the job done. So uh, I'll see you on the output side and we'll wrap this up. So the printer's too fast for me, and I'm just running my mouth here. But as you can see, the banner came out. It's laying on the input table. However, these tables simply roll away like this. Maybe if, we're, if we are doing uh, roll, roll, roll to roll, flexible in any, in any respect. And also, they also fold away, roll away and fold up. The input table does the same thing, and the extension tables do the exact same thing. And here we have our finished banner. Cut that off, and then go right back to printing rigids. All right, Tom, we're going to hand it over to you at this point. Thank you, Fernando. Dan, thank you very much. Uh, well done, guys. So I wanted to share uh, my screen with you. So hopefully you can see that. Um, so this is a slide you saw a couple times today. Uh, it's the R series applications and and like I said earlier you know one of the nice things about the R series is that you can get into different verticals with this if we took a look at uh, key point intelligence for for one second you know the the two prevailing vertical markets these days are is decor and packaging and those have growth rates anticipated now this is this is pre covid but still the growth the growth rates of these are anywhere from 13% all the way up to 18% year over year. And 
really that's what we're trying to empower people to do. We're trying to come up with technology that enables them to grow their business through, you know, good sound markets. So for example, if you're in the banner market or if you're in the vehicle graphics market, those are single digit growth markets. Again, nothing wrong with them. And this printer does handle those requests, but really this aligns you with the future. So I just want to share a few slides with you and just, just talk about a couple things. Uh, first of all, if you, if you haven't noticed, um, and again, it's kind of hard on a virtual, but if, you're, if your reseller rep uh, brings you anything in packaging, it is the next best thing to litho printing you've ever seen. Um, because they're latex inks, you don't have to worry about cracking or peeling, but you do get, you don't get a thickness to it, and you get a great feel in corrugated. This could be um, E flute, B flute, it could be honeycomb. Uh, you know, this is probably one of the toughest boxes that you would ever, ever think about doing because it has rich black, it has red, it has neutral grays, and this printer handles those all within, um, you know, all within a day's work. So uh, anyway, so packaging is a, is, a, is a big thing, and we've got several customers that have embraced that. And again, they are doing the prototypes. They are doing the short runs. They are doing the merchandising things for, uh, for, for different types of campaigns. And then the other thing I talked about was decor. And, and again, you know, we've preached decor for years and years and years, but decor is something that commands higher margins. Uh, it's, it's lower quantities. It's typically boutique type of work. But again, if we're talking image quality, like, like Fernando and Dan showed you, if we're talking about color gamut, when you put all these things together, the R series fills gaps that UV leaves us with, okay? The gaps of, you know, look and feel, okay? This, this uh, slide I'm showing now is brushed, okay? Now the brushed effect comes through the ink. Again, there's really never ever been a technology that's been delivered to the market where you can do things like this. So our customers are really enjoying, uh, you know, showing these and educating their customers. Uh, and that's been, been very positive. Same thing about glass. I don't think I've ever had as many requests to print on glass or acrylic or any kind of interior decor, just because you don't see any banding. You don't see any matte look of a, of a suppressed UV ink. You don't smell uh, a UV ink. Um, and you don't have that texture. So, so glass is another one for, for interior decor, um, even metalized wallpaper. This is a demo I helped a um, reseller with a while ago, and it was just, it was just great. Um, being able to use white ink in a spot function or an under flood function, um, and then printing colors on, you know, various types of gold metallic, silver metallic. And again, when you're mixing those mediums with the uh, HP latex ink. It's just, it, it's um, gonna give you great results. Uh, Self-adhesive vinyl, you know, Fernando and Dan talked about uh, uh, sandwich modes. Um, you know, we just increased the productivity of our sandwich modes in our latest firmware. So it's something our customers have been asking about, uh, but we can do three layer and we can do five layer. This, this happens to be just a, a translucent sticker, but really uh, it shows you white ink. Okay, um, and if you didn't pick it up, uh, you know, 90, in the upper 90s of our customers are using white ink, okay? Um, but on the roll to roll, uh, just by itself, um, about 25 or 30% of all ink consumed on the roll to roll is white, because they can, because you can. You can print PET, you can print polyester, you can print all, all different types of things on, um, Using the, using the white ink, uh, and here's another one using either a polypropylene cling or a uh, you know another type of cling. Our white ink and our um, our inks in general don't emboss the material. It's just a very flat image, and again, it's got that litho uh, look and feel to it without giving any any trade offs to the um, to the overall appearance. And then one that's kind of close to my heart is actually thermal forming. You know. Um, Fernando mentioned it um, briefly, but thermal forming is something that um, uh, you really can't do digitally. Um, I mean, you, you could, there's very few people that do it, um, but they don't do it very well. And with our products, you can get extremely good density up to 390%. 
uh, density, and then the ink can surpass uh, uh, well over 400 degrees. So we've got many sites in the U.S. that are forming these kinds of products, whether it be outdoor signage, you know, some industrial and stuff, lots of POP and gaming and backlit and so on and so forth. And then the last slide, again, I'd like to just, you know, reiterate our trophy room. Uh, we're very proud last year. It was our first entry into the uh, SGIA uh, product of the year, for which we were two for two on our entries. This was uh, displayed at Printing United. And had we gone to Orlando uh, back in April, um, we would have been awarded the, uh, the ISA Innovation Award in the, in the printer category. And this is an award that's real special to us because there's only one printer selected. So again, we're bringing this new technology. People are enjoying it. Uh, our customers are having great success. It's been a very, very stable platform. Um, with that, I'd like to open the rest of the time uh, for Q&A. So we can invite Chuck back. And if anyone has any questions, um, we, can, uh, we can answer those. And Tom, if you want to moderate any of those. Yeah, I would say uh, drop your questions into the chat box. There's a place down There's there. A, we already actually have a few questions, questions so I'll uh, in, correct. I'll start uh, if you don't mind, Tom. I'll read some Go of those for us. That's great. Thanks, Brian. How does the gamut compare to sRGB? Fernando is our G7 uh, certified person on site at HP, and uh, I'll let him field that question. Sure. So um, there's still a this uh, product still a CMYK uh, color space, right? So we all know uh, there's different uh, color spaces. There's RGB, CMYK, um, and then we have lab and so on. Uh, but we have found that even if you have an RGB workflow, you still get uh, beautiful, vivid colors that typically you wouldn't get with a six color. Uh, um, UV technology. Uh, so having said that, uh, we still feel that we have a much larger gamut and you'll be able to reproduce uh, closer uh, to what the RGB color space uh, is. Of course, there's still limitations. RGB still happens to be uh, a large gamut, specifically if you use like Adobe RGB. Hopefully that uh, answered your question. Uh, we have a user that needs to print on painted coil 24 gauge steel and they want to switch from sublimation um, and this they think may be the solution for them. Dan, could you speak to that and maybe grab that metal piece that you were showing earlier and um, maybe we can go to live view on him? So that's, uh, am I, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yep, you. Yep. Can you hear me? So that's a great opportunity, I think. You know, this being a, a metal here, uh, this is a, a brushed metal, and you can see the, uh, the reflection on it and the smoothness. And I understand with dye sublimation. And explain that, that white on there too, Dan. So, okay, so with this one, with this particular piece, this is, starts out as a brushed aluminum, like a gray look to it, right? Uh, the white that you see here is our white ink. There is also white ink behind the surfer only, and no white ink uh, where you see the, what represents the water, okay? So that's what gives her normal skin tone color, otherwise we'd be printing onto that gray. Uh, helps this pop right here, the Hawaii, and of course the awesome effect you get because you're seeing that, that metal uh, through, through our very, very thin ink. So in yeah, some what, ways, maybe even better than what you would do with sublimation, because you well, have the ability to put white in there like that. Absolutely, you have that opportunity. With the sublimation, um, they, I understand too, it sublimates and it is a, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's in the surface, you know, it's, it's in that, that polyester surface. So with something like this, when you're going with sublimation or, or, or trying to compare that, it is apples and oranges. However, this process here, if you're already doing dye sublimation, this is something that is absolutely worth for you to explore 
and decide, but these products can be printed faster and cheaper. Your, your material is not special material. You know, we can, we, we, as long as we have the right uh, surface tension to our metals, and of course, anything digital or anything you get from your suppliers, it's going to print to it. That right there, that alone is well worth looking into and that you could decide what products you want to sublimate, which ones you don't, how you want to manage that, or maybe even offer another line. Uh, as to Brian's point, using the white ink, et cetera, that you might not be doing now. It's an absolute compliment. I would be all about that if I was in sublimation. Yeah, uh, follow one, up. Yeah, just one thing, Brian. It's important that the question asked about steel, and we were talking about aluminum. So two different things. Everything Dan said was, was correct. Steel does have a different surface tension than aluminum. So without getting in the weeds of too much about adhesion and things, um, it does perform very well on steel as well as aluminum. So um, it all depends on the coating, but that's something that you would certainly want tested before you, you do that. And we have customers that print on 24 gauge steel very, very well, and they put a, a thick coating on it. And then the product they feel exceeds that of Chromalux, which is the dye sub product. So I just wanted to add that. Sure, great, Tom, great info. And there's a follow-up to that, uh, which kind of goes in line with what you were saying with coatings, and that is, are there any recommended ink adhesion promoters, uh, and, or are they generally unnecessary with latex? Who wants to field that one? Tom, Dan? Yeah, I'll, do it. I'll, I'll raise my hand, you just can't see it. Um, yeah, so, so there, are, there are some things that you have to use adhesion promoters for, even, even with latex. And like I said, for low surface tension things. So the days of using adhesion promoters for polypropylenes and, uh, you know, fluted, you know, coral type products, you know, as, as Dan showed you today, the adhesion is phenomenal. So, so those are really in plastics are kind of, kind of a thing of the past. Glass, ceramic, yes, you probably would have to use an adhesion promoter and certain types of, um, uh, certain types of metals um, that have varnishes on them. But again, uh, it's very, very few and far between that we run across an application where we have to use adhesion promoters. I would think some of that knowledge could be gained from our online HP Latex Knowledge Center, correct? That's a gr yeah, great, great way to bring that up, Brian. So we have the Latex Knowledge Center. Uh, it's, it's open to, to everyone. Uh, it's HP latexknowledgecenter.com, and we have what are called cookbooks uh, on various applications. So I believe there's three uh, cookbooks right now. We have one on printing on aluminum composites. Um, we have one on acrylics, and we have one on thermoforming. And all the information about uh, substrate preparation would be in there. So thanks for bringing that up. Yep. So one last thing on the sublimation, a follow-up comment was that uh, sublimation fades in sunlight and you won't see this fade for three years with latex, right? So I can answer that one. Um, that is true. Our, our uh, ink does not fade in direct sunlight for three years outdoors with no lamination over the top of it. Now, if you were to take that metal piece and add a coating to it that offered some sort of UV uh, inhibitor than that you would gain by HP standards at least another two years. So you would get five years outdoor durability with no color fade. And when we say no color fade, we mean nothing more than two delta E. And if you know anything about that, two delta E is something you can't see with your human eye. You would have to use a spectro to even see that much of a, of a color change. If you're printing indoors, we'll just cover that while we're talking about this. If you're printing for something that's going to go indoors, we offer five years and we're talking direct sunlight just inside the glass. So if you're printing for a storefront sign and it's going to be inside, so it's out of the weather, we offer five years with no lamination. If you laminate it, 10 years. If you're printing to canvas, which this printer can do, you can print to either a framed stretch canvas directly to the, the, the piece, uh, maybe with some jigs or something like that to carry the piece through. You could also just print to the actual raw canvas because we have the roll feature as well. That canvas, once you've put it into an interior space, is almost ar archivable at that point. We've done testing on it that say that it'll last 100 to 200 years. It depends on the canvas you picked. 
probably the canvas would start breaking down before that happened. But uh, the next question, um, what's the average cost per square foot for inks? Tom, you want to handle that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it depends. So um, there's two different models of printers, okay? Uh, the, you have the R1000, which uses printer, or which uses inks in three liter containers. And then you have the R2000, which uses ink in five liter containers. As with anything buying in volume, when you buy the larger containers, you usually get a discount. But um, the inks are governed by what we call MRP. Uh, it's, a, it's a floor uh, that things can be acquired uh, uh, through the channel. And typically when you're printing on uh, solid surface boards at our middle type of speed, uh, the ink is about 11 to 12 cents a square foot on the R2000. Whenever you compare it with the more expensive ink uh, because of the lesser container on the R1000, there's usually a delta of about one and a half to two cents. So. So, so I like to say somewhere in the 11 to 13 cent range for solid surfaces. Um, if you print faster like Dan did today, where he printed on the material in a, a, a three pass or four pass mo mode, you can achieve an economy to that. And then if you do print with more passes uh, and you want a heavier ink lay down, uh, then you would, you would pay more. But generally, uh, that's kind of the middle of the road for us. That's the best way to answer that. If you do have questions, you know, we can always take those online and look at your specific application, but generally that's the guideline. Can you use one of the ink stations with a custom blended corporate color that does not translate well in CMYK? That uh, is not doable on the R series. Um, we do offer CMYK light cyan and light magenta, as well as the overcoat and white and the optimizer. Um, those channels can't be changed out to other spot colors like you would in an indigo press or something like that. However, uh, we have overloaded the pigment in this ink. Uh, Dan, can you talk to that? So with the yep, so with the R yep, series yep. ink, yeah, we uh, we have a higher higher pigment. We have the largest um, we have the largest gamut um, um, to date with our with our latex latex inks. Uh, we can also, um, as we can't change the channels out, but as uh, Brian pointed, we can print with white, we can print with six color, and you could also choose uh, to print with four color, uh, CMYK. The, the, the ink itself being, um, ha having more pigment um, it, by ratio is what allows us also to cure at a lower temperature. So when you're talking about printing to plastics and polystyrenes and things like that, we're, low, we're printing at a temperature that's lower than our other uh, late, latex printers. We have no need for moisture extractors or IR lamps or anything like that. Um, we have a very straightforward system uh, to, to cure the inks as well, which is um, convection, heat, and, and airflow. Also, I'd like to add, um, you know, with latex, you have the versatility of adding uh, more ink load in different uh, print modes, right? So Dan printed today at 80% ink uh, uh, or 90% ink and then, yeah, 90 and 80. So you do have the versatility of uh, increasing your uh, ink load. Uh, this way you can increase your gamut. For example, recently we had a customer, he wanted to see Coca-Cola red uh, and we were able to achieve Coca-Cola red on a clear substrate within two Delta E. And I think that was amazing, just with the six color configuration. Just wanted to uh, add that. Yeah, great point, guys. I mean, you can go either direction, right? You can open up your color gamut with this, this really well pigmented CMYK light cyan and light magenta, or if you have an economical mode that you need to get into because you're trying to meet some particular customer's budget, uh, you can slip into CMYK. You didn't have to do anything to the machine. The machine knows. You, you just create that pass mode that says, I'm only going to use four color. You're not taking the light colors out to put white in. White stays in. The light colors stay in. You just choose what you want to do. Okay, any other questions? 
Ah, do the tables come with the printer or are those additional? Dan, if you could, um, I, I know you didn't get to show this uh, quite well yet. Maybe you could do it from the opposite side or grab one of the other tables, but can you show how those tables fold up and then talk about what comes with each model? Yeah, I think the input side might be easier because I have a whole bunch of samples. Uh, I'm using this as a production table now. It's very common. Let me run input side. You can show how you remove it and how easy it stores away and all that good stuff. So I'm just removing the edge, the roll holders. And the table comes with uh, just two latches. One on one side, one on the opposite side. This is the input table, we'll say that comes with the printer. If it was say the R1000, uh, your base model. This with the R1000 plus, R2000 plus, it includes um, extension tables as well. This being your input table can simply roll away like I mentioned earlier and fold away. This. The output table is the exact same way. Your extension tables, they look just like this. They're another 37 inches. They look identical to these, to, these, um, to these tables and they act the same way. And when you want to use an extension table, right here we have the same connector that we have on the printer itself. It simply rolls up and latches onto here. Now I can take, when I, when I mentioned the four by eight boards, I could lay two four by eights up um, uh, portrait, same thing on the output side, have them come out and, and the tables would hold that. Yeah, we actually had a customer who had like yoga mats that they were printing on or gym mats for a school, right? We did this uh, kind of thing with them and we put as many extension tables as we could together. You could just click, click them on like Lego blocks and just keep adding more and more. And, and yeah. the printer doesn't care because it's belt driven. It's not locked to a specific bed size, right? So we're, we're not having to fit, you know, we, we can't, we don't have to tell our customer, oh, we can't print anything bigger than five foot by 10 foot. Oh, we please. can print, you know, 10 foot, well, 98 inches across by however many tens of feet you want through. Yeah, the, the, these tables as well. I mean, they have, of course, the rollers on top that guide the media in, but they also have a level on the side here and multiple adjustments on the tables, on the, on the legs, uh, you know, just to turn screws to make sure it's balanced um, in case the floor is uneven. So very simple um, with all that versatility, but also super like st strong, really robust, you know, that, that, uh, that people can, you know, that it's, it's, um, it does its job. You can, you can stack media on here when you're loading it and the same thing you can allow it to collect on the output side within reason. Yeah, we have some customers that use the extra extension tables as a staging area when they're not connected to the printer. Yeah, all the time. Okay, um, we had another ink cost question. Um, how does the, uh, the ink compare on the R2000 to the 3500 printer? I think what might be best with some of these ink cost questions is to talk to your sales rep. Uh, because it's going to be uh, based on a few different factors. If you have multiple printers, there's, you're buying direct from HP, you're buying from a reseller, it, it, it all depends. It's dependent upon what that reseller is offering. Um, so it, it's really a question for them. As uh, Tom said, we have a floor that we sell the price you know, of the ink at, and then it's up to the reseller to resell that ink. Um, so it's, it's really going to be it comes down to who you're getting the ink from. Okay. Uh, I think that's about all we have time for at this point. Uh, just a couple of wrap up, or well, actually one wrap up thing. Uh, I'm going to launch a poll. It's three questions, multiple choice. It's not a test. It's just to give us some feedback on how you thought we did today. It's completely anonymous. So, uh, if you'd fill that out, that would be greatly appreciated. And uh, basically after that, we are done. Thank you for attending. I do see one comment, Tom, that I'll make uh, reference to in the chat field. It didn't make it into the Q&A, but uh, it said to make sure that we mentioned that our cost per square foot includes the cost of print heads and the printing. 
print head cleaning kit, which is uh, the part of the automation that the operator doesn't have to clean the bottom of the print heads. So all that's rolled into square foot cost when we talk about costs. Try doing that with your UV printer. Try estimating when you're going to have to replace print heads. Try estimating how much ink you're purging. All that's cost too, but it's not calculated. Mm -hmm. So folks, as we close down, uh, again, thank you very much for taking time. We hope this was informative and enjoyable. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to chatting again in the near future. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.